I don't have to tell you, of course, that we have lived through and we're still living through the dual crisis, banking and, and the euro crisis. We have all learned as economists that uh, macro policy and micro policies are completely intertwined. So I hope we never talk about two different fields in the future. Um, and we see some institutional uh, moves. We have Basel III, of course. And more recently, since we are going to talk about systemic risk, I would like to talk about the creation of systemic risk boards, um, both in Europe. Uh, you know that the ESRB has been created on top of uh, three new European um, supervisor authorities for banking, insurance, and markets. Um, in the U.S., you have a similar thing with very different uh, approach. Maybe we talk about that. Now, what are those supposed to do? They are supposed to take care of systemic risk, financial instability. You would like to know, if you want to know the health or you know, the solvency of a bank, for example, you would like to know also the balance sheet of other banks and other insurance companies because you like to know what will happen. So if Bank Sabadell wants to sell some assets real estate assets, for example, in the market or some securities. You have to know whether uh, it, the, it will be in a situation of fire sales because other banks will basically have to sell at the same time. Uh, so it's just intelligent microprudential supervision to know the set of balance sheet of the entire financial system. But it, in a sense, it's just standard uh, prudential regulation done right. Second interpretation is that you, have, uh, you are trying to correct market failures. I first want to define financial stability, uh, not because it's fun to, to have a long list of what it means, but um, in central banks you notice that they, there is no standard definition and it's a little bit all over the place. And that's important if you want to think about the mandate of this institution. So I want to talk about the multiple facets of financial stability. Uh, and then we'll go on to discuss the toolkit, because if you have different meanings of financial stability, you also have different instruments uh, to deal with those. In a shorter second part, I will talk about the institution of macroprudential supervision and talk in particular in Europe, about Europe, talk about the mandate of the agency, incentives and likely behavior, and talk about subsidiarity, because I think that in Europe we have a serious problem with the way we organize regulation. There are lots of open issues and this is something that we should probably have a discussion about uh, today. Let me start with a list of uh, different notions of systemic stability or systemic risk. The first one is, um, has to do with imbalances and the notion of asset bubble, like real estate bubbles, which we know are dangerous for financial systems. Uh, they burst. <laughs> and of course, uh, there is a wealth effect for the financial institution uh, when the bubble burst. And I will be tempted to say that they tend to burst at the wrong time in an unjust way. So what happens is that bubbles, they actually tend to uh, increase investment and economic activity uh, through an effect which is a liquidity or store value effect. So if, you have, if your assets uh, gain in value, you are wealthier, you have more stores of value, then you can lever up that, that wealth and you can invest more. And that's going to fuel economic growth and activity. But um, when they burst, um, then it's going to reduce uh, the institution's financing ability and raise interest rates, unless you have a very strong reaction of the central bank, which of course you often have. But then when you have a crash, then there is a wealth effect, but also at that po precise point of time, uh, this is a moment of time where you would like to have the money. So in a sense, you are going to lose money exactly when you would like to have it. This is the only slide where you have an equation, so just to illustrate what happens. Um, those of you who don't like equations, forget. You can take a nap for two minutes. Um, it's just a very simple standard equ investment equation where to invest you, you have your liquidities or your cash or your wealth, which is called AT at the AT in that, in that slide. But also you can lever up your investment so you can promise issue securities against uh, the income you can pledge to your investors. So if you can pledge row zero per unit of investment, um, then 
you can lever up promises future dividend or coupon but you how much you are going to be able to lever up depends on the rate of interest between say t and t plus one and that's called the funding liquidity the funding liquidity is what you can get just by issuing more securities but you see immediately that when a bubble burst your wealth decreases 80 decreases but at the same time the interest rate falls down because you have fewer store values the price of those stores of value goes up the rate of interest goes down and that's going to basically be the point of time where your leverage is most efficient so you'll have a double whammy in a sense a bubble burst 80 and rt plus one falls and you have a double effect it's bubbles Actually, they are good as long as they last. You know, they fuel economic growth. It's just like when they crash, you know, they, when they burst, uh, you're in big trouble if, if they are held by highly levered entities. So what do you do to prevent bubble if that's a goal? Um, you know, one thing could be monetary policy, so you could raise interest rates uh, to, f to prevent the bubble from, uh, from occurring. Uh, but that has a cost, and that has a cost, and also it has to be sustained. So the credibility, I mean, are you going to raise interest rate for five years just to kill the bubble? It's not completely clear. Probably the best, the better approach is to use prudential and fiscal policy. So uh, you control new investment, a loan to value, debt to income regulation. And in the U.S., I will say stop subsidizing home ownership. It's ideology in the U.S. I mean, much less so in Europe, but in the U.S., it's really ideology. And, and they have, you know, they have so many subsidies, direct and indirect, to housing that they, they could at least get rid of some. Um, you could control risk to net worth, and that's, that's true for any, any other type of risk for the banks through provisioning and counter-cyclical buffers, uh, as they are discussed in Basel III. Another type of um, imbalances is foreign exchange imbalances. Um, and there are two issues there. Um, there is the old style issue, the ones you, we had in the late 90s when there were crises in Eastern Asia and elsewhere, or Argentina, which had to do with uh, the structure of borrowing. Um, there was also a level issue, but there was a lot of discussion about the structure of borrowing. The fact that many countries, in particular emerging countries, um, borrow in in dangerous liabilities, a trilogy of dangerous, dangerous liabilities, debt rather than equity, uh, for the direct investment, short-term debt, and debt which is denominated in foreign currency, in dollars, for example, which makes it uh, very difficult to devalue, because if, uh, if your debt is in dollars and, and you have to pay back your debt, then uh, the liabilities are inflated. Um, so you, you create a lot of trouble for your private sector and your financial sector. And also that gives some rise to some capital flow volatility because you are borrowing short term. And that could create a run on the country just like you have runs on banks. By the way, I should say that um, there is a trade-off between country commitment and country risk management. Risk management means that you should avoid these dangerous forms of liabilities like debt having more foreign direct investment, having debt which is longer term and let debt which is peso denominated or local currency denominated. But of course, that also makes the government more accountable because that means that if you have dangerous forms of debt, if the government misbehaves and has the wrong economic policies, it, the country is going to suffer more. And that may also be a disciplining device. Now, you can discuss whether it's a good thing or bad thing and you know, there are arguments both ways. It also, of course, depends on politics and expectation, and of course, on who else is debt. I mean, much of the analysis assume that the debt is held by, by foreigners, but of course, there's, there's work, including by people in this room, saying that, well, it depends. You know, there is some, uh, you know, you have some incentive for domestic uh, older, for domestic investors to hold some of that debt, and that's going to make a big difference about whether they will be default or not. Then there is a more, that was the, the debate 10 years ago, and now in Europe we have another debate, which is about the level of borrowing, which of course also existed in the previous debates. And with the issue about Maastricht, um, you know, in Maastricht, of course, we, when we thought about Maastricht, when people, I didn't, <laughs> but you know, when people thought about Maastricht, uh, they thought that you know, public debt could be bad, um, 
that could, of course, create a blackmail either for the central bank to, to bail out uh, through inflation, for example, or it could be a blackmail to get other countries to step in and, and land. So they said 60%, okay? So 60% public debt. And of course, uh, measuring public debt is very hard. We have always known that. But it's particularly hard um, because I think we know the possibility that bank debt might become public debt, which of course is not, not a new thing, but it's pretty clear. I mean, if you take Ireland, which moved from a deficit of 12%, which is a big deficit, to 32% because of two or three banks, there you clearly have, have a view that bank debt can become uh, public debt. And of course, that, that might be a concern for Spain as well. The toolkit there is completely different. I mean, if you think that imbalances are due to foreign exchange primes, you know, capital control, monitoring the share of foreign currency loan, as usual, capital adequacy requirements, surveillance, everything you know about the debate on mass traces, you know, surveillance of competitiveness, and the big loss in competitiveness that our countries in the South uh, have compared to Germany, for example, uh, in the last 10 years. Prudential regulation, fiscal rules, and the like. So you, you already get different uh, different toolkit. Third concern: market freezes, fire sales, and we know there are various causes. For I mean, we have seen big freezes in 2008, and we know that there are various various causes for for that. One is accounting: the fact that um, if you're under historical cost accounting. It's well known that you want to sell winners and keep losers. You never want to sell losers because you will have to acknowledge that on your balance sheet and you'll have equity requirements. We have moved by and large more to market value accounting, but if there is any expectation of reclassification, what has happened actually lately, uh, that gives you incentives which are pretty close to historical cost accounting. So that's one, one of the reasons for why you may not longer trade assets and you may have um, uh, fire sales on those asset markets. Second possible reason which has been developed in the literature lately is a shortage, well, not lately, you, you had earlier paper by Ellen Gale and others, um, but there's all literature on that, on shortage of buyers with sufficient financial markets, Thus, also you, you want to sell an asset, but there is nobody on the other side which has the financial muscle to buy those assets. It's not a completely obvious proposition, by the way, if you want to think about it for, for those of you who are writing a PhD. I mean, it's, not, it's not a completely obvious proposition because if you expect uh, assets to be purchased, to be available for purchase at low prices, then you would like to hold liquidity. You would like to have stores of value that will allow you to take advantage of those bargains. But then if you have some kind of uh, planning like this, well, you know, you just have picking your IT externalities and what is the issue, and we could discuss that. But that's certainly a reason which has been mentioned for, for market freezes, that there is nobody else on the other side. It's like a buyer strike. Third reason, which of course is uh, adverse selection, there is a lack of trust in the assets. So you, you are worried about what you are buying. Um, now, the important thing, which um, is due to some recent work of Dan Gorton and Elmstrom, for example, is that adverse selection tend to increase uh, when there are bad news. So again, we have some kind of double whammy effect, which is first there are bad news, so the value, uh, the value goes down. But on top of that, uh, the solvency issue becomes more important because you get into the region where you have solvency prime, so people start inquiring uh, getting information that creates additional adverse selection that make it, can make things worse.